okay. So, we were discussing uh, MMSC estimate right. First of all we said, so we define the conditional expectation, uh, expectation of y given x, we define this as a random variable which is measurable under the sigma algebra sigma x right. So, I mean in more plain language expectation of y given x is a random variable which only depends on x right. To say it a little more mathematically precisely it is a sigma x measurable random variable right. So, we call this some psi of x right and we said that. So, we define this only for the case when x and y are discrete and for the case when x and y have a joint PDF, the case when x and y are jointly continuous right. Only in those, those two cases we could define this in terms of uh, an expectation with respect to the conditional density or the conditional PMF and then blindly replace the actual value with the random variable right. That is how we defined it, it is somewhat, uh, it is a very elementary way of defining it. And we said that, so we said the iterated expectation holds So, this is the law of iterated expectation. Uh, so, we said expectation of expectation of y given x equal to expectation of y. So, this we proved again by explicitly rightly writing it out for the case of discrete and jointly continuous random variables. And for I also said for any we said also for any measurable g, uh, well any measurable g, we said expectation of y minus psi of x times g of x equal to 0 right, right this is what we said last time. And this again you can show by explicitly writing it out whenever this is defined right. Expectation of another way of saying it is expectation of y g x is same as expectation of uh, g of x times the conditional expectation. Okay. Now, this result we interpreted geometrically right. We said that you can view psi of x as an estimate of y that only depends on x right. Suppose x and y are some dependent random variables and you want to estimate y, but you cannot observe y right. Let us say you can only observe x and you want to somehow come up with an estimate for y. All right. So, if you view this as an estimate, the expectation of y given x as a random variable which estimates y only based on x, then y minus psi of x represents your estimation error, right. So, what this is saying is that uh, in this, uh, this er estimation error is orthogonal to any function of what you observe, what you observe, correct. So, we, we already established that the square integrable random variables are a Hilbert space right. So, and the covariance plays the role of the inner product right. So, in that sense we have uh, I just drew a uh, picture that said if you if you are looking at the subspace of sigma x measurable random variables. So, this is so this whole space I am drawing it like R 2, but it is actually the space of uh, the Hilbert space of square integrable random variables. In that sigma x measurable random variables form a subspace of the Hilbert space. And what you are saying is that if your random variable y is some some random some point here and you have to estimate y based only on things in this subspace right. So, if you have to pick a sigma x measurable random variable which is the best estimate of your y 
geometrically it seems clear that you should pick the foot of the perpendicular right and this foot of the perpendicular is really what your conditional expectation is so that y minus i of x which is your estimation error is orthogonal to the space of is the subspace of sigma x measurable random variables okay is that clear so that is the interpretation we gave now so this is something we this is a result you can prove explicitly by writing it out for the case of discrete random variables and uh, jointly continuous random variables uh, but for more general cases where x and y may be anything right where mixtures or singulars or whatever we didn't even define the conditional expectation right we don't know how to define it in fact this is taken as the definition of conditional expectation in the general case okay so you can actually prove that for any two random variables x and y uh, and any measurable function g there exists a random variable which is sigma x measurable such that this error is orthogonal to any function of x okay the existence of such a random variable can be proven and it's and such a random variable can be shown to be unique uh, except for a set of measure 0 okay so this conditional expectation exists uniquely in a in an almost sure sense right okay so that existence can be proved okay that is how you define conditional expectation in a more general setting this is taken as a defining equation okay is that clear so now and then we also said that psi of x is an mmse estimate of y that is for any function <coughs> h we have expectation of y minus psi of x squared is less than or equal to expectation of y minus h of x squared okay so if you have any h of a h h of x will be a sigma x measurable random variable right it will be some random variable in that subspace correct now what we are look what we are saying is that for any random variable on that subspace the error y minus the squared error the mean squared error this is called right the expected squared error squared error is smallest when you choose this particular psi of x okay and that is again fairly clear because of uh, this orthogonal interpretation right i mean if this were a normal euclidean space this is not a euclidean space this is a hilbert space uh, if it's a normal euclidean space you would obviously choose the foot of the perpendicular as your closest point and that intuition holds perfectly right and therefore the psi of x is called the minimum mean squared error estimate mmse estimate okay how do you prove this so i'm going to prove it like this i'm going to write expectation of y minus h of x squared is equal to expectation of y minus psi of x squared plus expectation of psi of x minus h of x squared 
plus So I'm going to write this as, so I'm just trying to decompose this, right? I'm going to write this as y minus i x plus i minus h x. So I should have a twice expectation of, what would I have? y minus psi x times psi x minus h x. Correct. Fine. Now, what can you say? So, you agree with this equation? All right. So, I'm just this is just algebra, right? I'm just expanding everything out. I hope I have not made a mistake. So, now if you look at this term, right, it looks like so you can consider this as a function of x, right, this is some gx, right. So, what you will have is this whole thing is what 0, right. So, this term is 0, you see why because of that property, correct. And this term is obviously non negative, right. So, this must be greater than or equal to that. Is that clear? So, if you look at this, so if you if you just look at this, so this term is 0, right. So, what this is saying is expected y minus h x squared is equal to expected y minus psi x square plus psi x minus h x square which is simply Pythagoras theorem right in this space right all right. So, this result follows okay. So, what so this proof is using this fact which again you 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 uh, prove using your elementary definition for discrete and uh, jointly continuous random variables. But what you can show, see in more generality, what you can show is that I mean you cannot, you, so this is taken as some kind of a defining property, right? This is taken as a defining property, and you have to show that such a psi x exists uniquely up to a set of measure 0, right? So what you have is that. In more general settings, this is not, I mean, this is not something you have to worry about too much, but let me just tell you that if you just consider expected y minus, uh, let us let me say y minus z squared, and I take infimum over all z which are sigma x measurable, okay. So, I am considering that, so z is simply some parameter, so z is a random variable which lies in that subspace okay. and I am looking for that particular z which infimizes expected y minus z whole square, square error from, uh, this is a squared error from y. Okay. Now, this infimum is well defined, now the point is that this infimum is attained. Okay. The reason that this infimum is attained is because this this being a subspace of a Hilbert space, Hilbert spaces are continuous, right? I mean not I mean to say complete, right? Hilbert spaces are complete. So the, the space does not have any holes, right? So there must exist a z which satisfies which actually achieves this infimum, okay, and that infimum is your conditional expectation okay, and that infimum obviously satisfies this right by just algebra and that is how you define it in a more general setting at least in L2 spaces that is how you define it. Okay. Is that clear? I said I will be briefly indicate how you define 
conditional expectation in a more general setting, right? Which is exactly what I have done now, right? So this set, so this infimum is attained for some sigma x measurable random variable, and that uh, it's attained because the space is a complete space, being a Hilbert space, and uh, that z is called the conditional expectation, and it's unique up to a set of measure zero, okay? Is that clear? <coughs> Are there any questions? So, this concludes our study of conditional expectations. Okay, so, next we move on to <coughs> the next module or next section on <coughs> transforms. <coughs> so, we will study three types of transforms. So, we will study uh, actually we will first study probability generating functions, probability generating function or PGF. We have moment generating function. And we will study probably in most detail, we will study the characteristic function. So, good, uh, good, say good references for this will be uh, Grimet and Sturzaker, chapter 5, and Open courseware lecture fourteen and seventeen, lectures fourteen and seventeen. Okay, and of course I will upload notes. Okay. So these transform techniques are at some level they you can think of them as some frequency domain techniques, just like in your signals and systems you have your time domain techniques, your frequency domain techniques. So, you can think of uh, all your PDFs and PMFs as uh, some kind of time domain functions and these transforms as some frequency domain functions. Okay? So, that is a rough level of analogy. So, your, your knowledge of signals and systems will come in handy in this, uh, in this particular section. Okay? So, this probability generating function which is commonly used for <coughs> it's commonly used for discrete random variables particularly integer valued random variables this is uh, this is akin to your z transform z transform for your discrete for discrete time signals right and moment generating function is similar to uh, laplace transform okay and characteristic function is similar to fourier transform okay in some rough sense we will see okay we will see properly so these transform techniques are very useful uh, in a number of settings so sometimes they help their simple 
one simple use is that sometimes they help you compute things much easier right just like for example if you have to uh, convolve densities or convolve pmfs it's much easier to go to the in your in your signal system you go to the frequency domain multiply invert your transform back right so those sort of computationally they are useful and they also are very useful in analyzing certain stochastic processes like branching processes random walks uh, they are useful in proving limit theorems such as the central limit theorem strong law of large numbers and so on law of large numbers and so on okay so they have a number of uses okay So, let us deal with probability generating functions. Let x be a x be an integer valued random variable define g x of so you can define the g x of z is equal to expectation of z power x ok that is the definition of the probability generating function ok. Uh, so, this is an integer valued random variable. So, this is you can just write this as sum over i z power i probability that x is equal to y ok. So, z is just some parameter ok you can think of z as generally this z could be some complex number ok. So, you are what you are looking at is some uh, summation of a complex series ok and this looks like. So, if you were to look at this guy as some kind of a discrete time signal this looks very much like your z transform except usually you have a minus here for the z transform, but otherwise it is uh, analogous at least ok and you sum over all i. Okay. <coughs> now, of course, there is when you write down a series like this, there will be all sorts of questions on whether the series converges, what what kind of convergence does it? It is a complex series after all, right. So, you have to talk about what the region of convergence is, whether does it converges absolutely uniformly and so on, right. So, is so these convergence issues we will push push under the rug a little bit for this course, okay, because it requires a I mean it requires some knowledge of complex analysis ok. Uh, you already know I guess that from your study of signals and systems you know that z transforms the convergence regions are what kind of uh, figures? Huh? Uh, they are generally annular they are circular circles right in general circles are annular regions uh, then that is true here ok. It is uh, uh, there, there exists some radius of convergence ok. So, uh, let me just mention that. So, convergence so there exists R. So, this could be possibly infinite such that the PGF. what I mean by PGF converges is that the series converges right this PGF converges f 
for all z such that absolute value of z less than r and diverges for absolute z greater than r. Okay. Actually, I think this particular statement is I am uh, so I am missing out a little bit here. I think this statement is probably true for non-negative valued random variables, right? Otherwise, you could have these z power minus i terms, and you may have annular annular regions of convergence. So, if you if this statement, I believe this statement. Let me clarify this. But I think the statement is true for non-negative integer valued random variables. Right? Let me clarify this uh, once I confirm this. Uh, <coughs> The one thing you can say for sure, so this R may be infinity also, in which means that the series converges in all the in the whole complex plane. Okay. Uh, the one thing you can say for sure, though, is that this radius of convergence includes z equal to one for sure, right? Because uh, you will simply have so if you have uh, z equals one, right, or z absolute z is equal to one, then you will certainly have absolute g z is equal to absolute value of that which is less than or equal to absolute value of. Uh, so, you will just have 1 right. So, for z equal to 1 you have absolute convergence and therefore, uniform convergence right. So, this region of convergence will certainly include the unit circle right whatever else it includes or not it does certainly include the unit circle correct this region of convergence. I mean normally if this were some arbitrary discrete time signal that is not necessarily the case, but because this is a PMF your region of convergence will include the unit circle right. So, that much is you, that much is clear and whenever so if you are in the region of convergence you will have absolute convergence and therefore, uniform convergence okay. and therefore, this PGF will be well defined. So, and that is as much as I am going to say about convergence issues. Okay. So, I mean I am not going to dwell on this too much because it uh, it is we are mostly going to use it as a tool rather than worry about its existence and so on right. Uh, existence analyticity you can talk about all sorts of stuff for this complex of uh, this complex function, but we will use it mostly as a computational tool. Okay. So, I will not dwell on this convergence issues too much. Okay. I will confirm this statement's correctness. Uh, I am pretty sure it holds for non negative random variables, I will confirm this. <coughs> so, let us do an example. Let probability of x is equal to i is equal to e power minus lambda lambda power i by i factorial i equal to 0. So, pause on random variable here your g x of z will be sum over i equals 0 to infinity. right. <coughs> and that is simply the series for e power lambda z right. So, this will become e power lambda z minus 1 okay. <coughs> and that is an analytic function in all of the complex plane 
right it is it converges uniformly it is analytic in the whole complex plane ok. So, this is for any z in C. On the other hand if you try uh, doing this for geometric. So, if you have p x is equal to i is equal to 1 minus p power i minus 1 times p <coughs> then you will get g x of z is sum over i equals 1 through infinity 1 minus p z whole power i uh, times p is not it. So, that is equal to p z over 1 minus z times so sorry 1 minus p times z and that holds for absolute value of z less than 1 over 1 minus p correct. <coughs> so, that is your uh, radius of convergence or region, region of convergence it clearly includes absolute z equal to 1 right it always includes x absolute z equal to 1 it is a little bit bigger than that and depends on p ok. And out for z bigger than that it does not exist ok. Is that ok? So, uh, in terms of notation I am using big G for generating function ok and x I am suffixing it with the random variable I am talking about ok and z is the argument. <coughs> so, let us look at some properties. first property is that if you take d g d z and evaluate it at z equal to 1 you get expectation of Well, okay, so the maybe the property zero should be that gx of one is equal to uh, property gx of one is equal to one always, right? Uh, you can see in these cases as well, right? <coughs> gx of one is one. I'm saying that g prime of one is equal to the expectation of x. So if you know the probability generative function you differentiate it with respect to z and set z equal to 1 you get the expectation expectation of x. So, what is the reason that this is true first of all is does this derivative always exist see the region of convergence always includes you see it always includes the uh, the circle the yeah the unit the unit circle absolute z equal to 1 right so so in that case so in that case you will have an, an, an analytic function which for which, which you can differentiate and you can just set z equal to 1 right so the way of proving this is that so what you so you you are differentiating this right if you are differentiating this series essentially and you will get i z power i minus 1 right and you are setting z equal to 1 right and you get i times p x equal to i. So, which is the expectation right. The only thing that I mean again I am not being very precise about is that how you can take the derivative inside the summation and things like that right. If it is a finite summation you can do it, 
but so basically you are it is justified when the summation converges to an analytic function then you can take the derivative inside the sum. Okay. I am just pushing those details under the rug a little bit. Okay. <coughs> and you can show that uh, the kth derivative similarly you can show that the kth derivative <coughs> at z equal to 1 will give you expectation of x times x minus 1 times uh, x minus k plus 1. It is similar argument you can prove that. Okay. Similarly, analyticity at and if analyticity on the unit circle will imply this result, right. Third, if x and y are independent and z equal to x plus y, then g z well okay so now i have to be careful so let me call this something else then right uh, x plus y is equal to some other random variable um, what shall i call it well, let me just call it z and just call g z of s let us say right so, I mean I do not want confusion between the argument and the random variable. G z of s is equal to g x of s times g y of s. Okay, so, you can multiply the, so if x and y are independent z is the sum of the two uh, just like, so, so if x and y are independent then you will, <coughs> the discrete random variable. So, you will convolve their PMFs but convolving your PMFs is same as multiplying your PGFs just like in your uh, in your discrete if you have discrete time signals that are convolving you multiply the z transforms right this is a, this is the same result. Uh, I am writing s here just to avoid confusion with the random variable itself and the region of convergence will be the region where both converge intersection of the regions of the convergence. So, if you want to show that sum of two Poisson random variables is independent Poisson random variables, variables is a Poisson random variable, you can just directly look at this. Right? If one of them has parameter lambda, the other has parameters mu, then you can you can show that that the product will have parameter lambda plus mu. So, it is a Poisson with parameter lambda plus mu. So, in one shot you will get it without convolving and whatever, right? You get it. And obviously, this extends to n independent random variables also, you just multiply the PGFs. So, if you want to find the PGF of a binomial random variable, uh, you can take the essentially take the nth power of a the Bernoulli PGF, right, because binomial is sum of uh, Bernoullis, right. Yeah, so this is very useful. Okay, so we in your in your last quiz you had this problem on the negative binomial, right? So you try as an exercise, perhaps you want to try uh, taking the finding the PGF of the negative binomial, and then proving that the sum of those two negative binomials is another negative binomial, right? That is something you proved the hard way, I guess, but you can prove it easier using PGFs. Okay.
So, the last property I will talk about here property number 4 is about a random sum of. So, let us say z is equal to sum over i equals 1 through n x i right where x i is r i i d discrete random variables actually in positive integer valued random variables let us say and <coughs> n is independent of x i s. So, in this case you can show that g z of s you can denote by z n z big n if you like. Okay. So, g z of s is equal to g n of g x of s. Okay, so, if you want to find the PGF of this random sum of random variables, right. Uh, so, you take you compose the PGF of n and the PGF of s. Okay. And how do you prove that? You use iterated expectations. Okay. So, you have g z of g z of S is equal to expectation of uh, S power Z, right? That is, you write this as expectation of expectation of S power Z given N. Okay. This is by iterated expectations, right? And so if you fix an n, so you can compute this, right? Expectation of s power z given n. So if you are fixing an n, expectation of s power z will simply be the n time product of gx, right? Because if you fix n equal to little n, this will simply become i is equal to one to little n xi, and the PGF of that we know simply g x of s raised to the nth power right. So, but if you replace small uh, small n with capital N this will simply become expectation of uh, g x of s power big N no right I am skipping a step okay. and this looks like what you want right this is simply g n of g x of s. Okay. You have to be careful with the region of convergence. Okay. So, for example, you can now if you are summing let us say a geometric number of geometric random variables let us say x i is a geometric with parameter p n is geometric with parameter q. Okay. Uh, you go ahead and as an exercise you can try uh, you can try finding the distribution of z. Okay. If x i is a geometric with parameter p n is para geometric with parameter q they are all independent. Okay. Try this exercise okay, using this let us stop here.